we're talking about right now. We're going to be talking about the Blacksmith Festival this Saturday, September 29th. Yes. I have Ashla from Minuteman International. And um, we have uh, David and CJ from the Knights of the Lord Talbot. Right? Yep. So this year is the 15th Animal Blacksmith Festival. You can see our sign right here. And uh, it is not just a blacksmith festival, but it's also a renaissance fair. Isn't that right? Yes, Correct. it's a, a brand new edition for us. Uh, last year David came and he really thought it was a great forum to show his uh, talent and his group's talent. So we are looking forward to that. And they start with um, uh, some kind of music that they play. And David probably can tell more about it. I, ha I have not been to a Renaissance Fair since my childhood probably. And they do dress up in armor. Uh, and uh, they'll be selling products and uh, for the kids and families who want to buy a uh, Renaissance level thing. But the, uh, I'm going back to the blacksmiths as well because that's what I am, uh, uh, that part is entirely organized by me, me and my husband and few volunteers. We, will ha we have maximum participation this year. Every year the participation has been growing and uh, it's a function of how good the weather is and we are looking forward to great Saturday weather so I expect a lot of people to come and uh, this is an event that a lot of blacksmith as well as attendees uh, look forward to in Pittsburgh. Uh, we will have three categories, novice, intermediate and professional division competing. Novice generally has uh, students and uh, we think 19 students from Asabeth Valley have registered, seven from Bristol Plymouth School, and there are a couple independent who are students of the judge or they know from Connecticut. So Article. it's a blacksmith competition. Yes. yes, and we assign the projects and they do the projects in a limited time frame, which uh, we'll have a handout which you will know and plus a board that when you come you can see what all is being made. So and we can else. watch the blacksmithing live, we can watch them make make these things like different uh, on different categories of, of level of skill, yes. right, live, right? Yes, uh, they, these are functional pieces that they made, these are a small leaf that uh, some years ago professional people made and uh, there's live fire and it's a, uh, we do uh, recommend caution and then the highlight of it is the judge we invite is a professional black myth who will be demonstrating between 12 to 2 o'clock and that is really set up like a demonstration with people sitting around the way. Please come to the uh, different park and 10 to 5 o'clock is the price distribution and we give about $5,000 in cash prizes. The winners get ribbons and the champions get championship jackets. So that's Saturday, September 29th at Riverfront Park, which is right off Boulder Drive in Fitchburg from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. We have the Blacksmith Festival, which has been going on for 15 years. And now let's talk about the Renaissance Fair portion, which is the Body armor jousting combat. Mm -hmm. Com yep. Full body co combat. Full contact. Full contact com yeah. combat. I don't know why I can't remember that. And then we have the horse jousting. Yep. Right? Uh, yep. So when we have real life horses, that's right. That is correct. They're definitely real. They definitely eat like real life horses, that's uh -huh. for sure. <laughs> uh, no, uh, Talbot Company uh, got me and my group uh, uh, ironclad jousting involved in it just this past year. So uh -huh. he was like, hey, I want to come hit each so other. So we have the Knights of the Lord Talbot, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. Yep. And you're jousting. What's, what's it called? Ironclad. Ironclad jousting. Oh, so yeah. it's a collaboration between that and the Blacksmith Festival. Correct. And we just want to say that the, there is no entry. It's a free event. It's a free event. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. And so the jousting, you have a jousting and combat. You have different times that that's available, right? It starts at 11 a.m. And what does that start with? Uh, it starts with the live steel combat at 11. And that's with real swords. Yeah, real swords, unchoreographed, unrehearsed. Um, we Real do, fighting. Yes, yep. we take safety as the number one priority, but it is unchoreographed, unrehearsed. Um, then it leads into the 12 o'clock joust, which is a joust of peace. That's the, the horse the, joust. Yep. yep. The joust of peace is a little more games oriented, so it's not quite 
hitting each other as much, but it's more the skill of the night and you know the ability to really communicate with the horse well. So that's that's definitely that's a key part to being able to joust. And there's going to be a twist towards the end of that particular... <laughs> the Joust of War? No, nope. Joust of Peace. Joust of Peace. Joust of Peace. Oh, peace. Yeah, the Joust of the End One. The War and, and the Peace at the, uh, and then, are sandwiched. Yep. Oh. Then at 3 o'clock we have the war, uh, Joust of War, which chaos is going to erupt. There'll be chaos. Lots yeah. of chaos. Uh oh. Uh, Lots the of Knights of Lore tablet will be charging onto the field to assist our fellow knights on like horse. Like the flags and like, ah! No, uh, no, they're... With swords. All I know is that I get hit really hard, so... Yep. We'll, we'll, hard, hard. Yep. we'll wait to no, see No, but they're going to drag me off. But, but if we see blood, yes. that's not part of the show. No. no, don't panic, but it's not part of the show. Yeah. Yes. But so. there have been injuries. Yes, there have been some injuries, but we limit that down to <laughs> very minors. Um, the worst injuries we've seen is a dislocated shoulder from time to time, mm -hmm. or a bloody nose. Yeah, oh, yeah. So and you're prepared to handle We're fully prepared. Horses. Yes, <laughs> we're fully prepared for it. Um, my group, we go basically travel with a full triage kit, ready for just about anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank. We haven't needed it, <laughs> <laughs> but we mm -hmm. turn around and prepare for the worst and enjoy ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna have music. We're going to have stuff for the kids, face oh, painting yeah. and... Uh, face and, painting. And Iron, uh, there is a blacksmith who in the past has always competed, but his interest is a lot on medieval blacksmithy. Mm -hmm. And he has been teaching students and children using aluminum instead of iron. And that is soft that you can mold it with the, or, or beat it without heating and it's safe for children. So he is uh, this year coming not as a competitor for the competition but as an instructor and oh, he wants cool. to uh, give a demonstration. So there's lots of things for the kids to do. And mm -hmm. we'll have food, uh, hot dogs, hamburger, and an ice cream company is coming from Vermont. Mm -hmm. Oh, an ice they cream. They say they do a lot of uh, uh, fairs and their ice cream is very special, so I'm looking forward to that. And we have vendors uh, this yep. year also? Yep. yep. So they, they'll be vendors, they'll be jousting, they'll be real horses, they'll be fighting, they'll be peace. And a right. lot of hammering and a lot of hammering. Knock, knock, knock and fire. <laughs> All right, is there anything I'm missing? No, that, just that pretty much comes. Uh, oh, the oh, well, one thing we missed was the ROTC was here, yeah. the Monty Tech ROTC. We we shot a little segment earlier, but it got lost. Um, but the ROTC has been helping out with the Blacksmith Festival for the past ten years, right? Yes. They have uh, two groups of twenty ROTC. Mem students, students uh, that come in each shift. They they're super helpful. Absolutely, they, they help anything that needs to, and we also will have a raffle available just to raise funds because all the people who compete, especially the students, we provide them a lunch coupon as well as a t-shirt beside the uh, <clears throat> Uh, pri cash prizes that they get and ribbons they get. Mm. So all that cost is entirely borne by voluntary contributions from the community, my company, and also Ashley Enterprise Designs Bank. Designs and Minivan yeah, International. And Enterprise Bank, and we have uh, ICU Bank. Um, IC Credit I, I, Union? Yeah, Credit Union, and uh, Fidelity Bank uh, as our supporter, and then a friend, Alan and Dora Rebenoff have uh, always contributed to it. Uh, I may probably be missing a few, but uh, that's, uh, and uh, the certificate will be donated by the Wolf Lodge that we will be raffling. Oh, great. So a great Wolf Lodge raffle as well. So make sure that you come to the 15th Annual Blacksmith Festival at Fitchburg's Riverfront Park right off Boulder Drive, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Saturday, September 29th. We'll see you there. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you.
So I'm here with Kelly Jenkins, and now we're talking about the Yes on Three campaign, which is on our ballot on November... November 6th. November 6th, which is, which is uh, for our voting day here, right? It is. Which is coming up in what, 40 days? It Something seems like, like tomorrow, next day or so. It's getting happening so fast. So yeah. I think it's 45 days from now. Mm -hmm. So the Yes on Three campaign, I feel like, is, is something that um, not a lot of people know about. Well, all really all the ballot questions, you know, people are just educating themselves on them now, I see, on social media. Yep. So let's talk about what Yes on Three means. So in 2016, the mass Massachusetts state legislature in a supermajority added gender identity to the list of protections for people in the state of Massachusetts along with religion and race and sexual sexuality and things such as that. The governor then signed it, the Republican governor then signed it into law. Well, shortly thereafter, a group of citizens, a group of people from Massachusetts decided that they didn't like that law. Mm. So they started a petition drive and created enough signatures and developed enough signatures to where they can have this law put up for a repeal on mm -hmm. the November 6th ballot. So what happens is on November 6th, people in the state of Massachusetts get to determine whether or not me, a transgender woman, and all of the other transgender people in Massachusetts get to keep our rights and our privileges to go to public places such as restaurants, theaters, doctor's offices, gas stations, football stadiums, all of these public places right now I am protected to go into those. And, and just to, to pause for a second, before 2016 there was no protections. Correct. There, there, was was, no, there were no protections within our current laws. There was some protections for like public housing and employment, but there was no protections for public places such mm -hmm. as restaurants. So this was a law that was put into place in 2016. So let's back up. Let's say it's 2015. Uh, what, what kind of uh, situations could occur without this law? Well, I know people personally up here that have been refused service in restaurants simply for being transgender. I know people that are having trouble with their medical doctors, with health care because they are transgender, and people are saying that they do not want to service these people. And, and, and we're talking about, you know, discrimination, on, which is illegal on the basis of, of race, yes. of gender, Correct. of age, yes. but, on, but, of, but of a transgender um, situation. That, in 2015, that you could discriminate Correct. against someone freely. Correct. Right? Correct. Under the law. Under the law, you But could. so in 2016, that no longer was the case, but now it's on the ballot. If you vote no, you're voting for discrimination. Correct. Of transgender People. persons in, in Massachusetts. Correct. Correct. And one of the reasons that I moved to Massachusetts four years ago, I'm from East Tennessee. I know firsthand what discrimination looks like and I ended up, I'm an educator by trade, I'm a teacher. And in my school systems in the South, I was continuously released from positions by people that didn't want a transgender person working for them. Oh, okay, yes. I have been refused service in a restaurant in Tennessee. I have been asked to leave a place for using the women's restroom in Tennessee. I left that state coming up here because I knew firsthand that Massachusetts, even though there were no laws protecting me per se other than employment and housing, that this state is, is, welcoming. is welcoming. And I have loved it here, Sam. Ever since I moved here, my life has taken off and I've become such a productive human being simply because I can be myself. Well, we're the best state in the entire United States. I am not going to argue that. Mm -hmm. I am not going to argue that one bit, Sam. Except, you know, it, 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 well, it was disappointing to me that this question even got on the ballot, frankly. Well, one thing about Massachusetts, Massachusetts is the threshold to get a petition to be put onto the ballot is you have to get a certain percentage of the voters that is equal to, like, so if the governor got 100,000 votes, let's say 100,000 people voted for the governor, there would have to be a certain percentage of signatures to repeal a certain law that matched how many people voted for the governor. So it's tied to the governor? Yes. Oh, it's, it's tied to the election process of how many people voted in the election oh, for, okay. for the governor, yes. For governor. For governor. Yep. So right now we have strong support from several business leaders. We have support from faith leaders. The police chief's uh, the, union. The, the Chief, police chiefs unions there's also school systems I know several school systems that are in favor of this the school system that I work with is okay with me being transgender which was just that simple fact in my life Sam is mind-blowing that I came from a place where me being transgender was a hindrance to my success in life and up here the only thing that's a hindrance to my success in life is whether or not I can do a job as a teacher I, 
nothing else is it's not based on my gender it's not based on my age it's not based on anything based but on my, your ability my abilities and since I've moved here I now have a Massachusetts teacher's license and my dream is to get this teaching job somewhere in the state and start working with the kids as a teacher instead of as a teaching assistant mm -hmm. I had to put that on hold for because, this because of this yes on three campaign because I don't feel that I can truthfully do my job as an instructor as an educator while I'm at the same time fighting for my human rights right it, for me it's such a it's very surreal right now I can take my students that I work with to the Museum of Science with all of my other students right now I can go in that door no fear if this law is repealed someone at the Museum of Science can say I'm sorry we don't want you in here because you're transgender there go all of my students in without me because there is that level of discrimination that will be possible and so and and then if you you also take it to hospitals yes hospitals could choose not to treat you yes. uh, you can take it to uh, teenagers in high school high you know uh, I don't know how you'd exactly just is, is that true in high school well would, schools, would they be allowed to? Uh, in school systems there's protections there's in protections place already, yes there's already and this law and will that, not affect that supersedes this yes that law okay nothing so we're will talking happen about private school. places of business correct we're talking about em employment employment well <laughs> we're talking about we're talking about the ability to get to your employer even as mm -hmm. far as like I have to stop and get gasoline. I have. To, I want my Starbucks coffee, ride my the Dunkin' bus. Dunks. I want to ride the bus. I want all of those things, and there are certain things that will be taken away, or the security of knowing that I can't do those things will be there. Right. And whereas you know we can't discriminate on the basis of religion, we can't discriminate on the basis of you know all, sexual orientation. Correct. But it yeah. It, it's. It's hard for me to understand that I moved 900 miles from Tennessee to Massachusetts, and maybe that wasn't far enough. <laughs> I, I don't want to move anymore. If this doesn't happen in Massachusetts, if I lose my rights in Massachusetts, where will I go? Right. Massachusetts is one of the leading progressive states in the nation. I chose this state from Tennessee for the reason that it has one of the best education systems in the world, not mm -hmm. just the United States, but in the world. And I met people that were being their authentic selves, transgender children, transgender adults. I met these people being their authentic self, and it inspired me to move here. So at the drop of a hat, I met these people. I volunteered at a camp up here that works with transgender youth. A month after volunteering at that camp, I saw the light, and I left Tennessee. Packed my four-door Honda Civic with anything I could shove inside of it, which included my two dogs and my cat, and I left everything else behind. I knew no one up to here. To sunny Massachusetts. To sunny Massachusetts. <laughs> In 2014, 15 was my first winter here. That mm -hmm. was the winter when there was maybe 30,000 and, and you learned to love snow I learned how to shovel snow very <laughs> well and I learned how to live in snow I would rather have 30 feet of snow than be discriminated against any day of the mm -hmm. week I, it can be as cold as it wants but let me go to my public and places so and so really when we hear um, uh, people that are you know seem to be uh, again voting seem to be wanting to vote no I, on on three it seems to be all, all solely on this the bathroom issue it's um, sexual predators are going to go in the bathroom with my daughters that's the fear that's the same story that I hear so what do you say to that um, well there's laws in place that say if you're a predator in a bathroom that's illegal and it's a criminal offense that has not changed so if any offenses criminal or take place in a restroom it's already illegal it's already illegal there has been research done since this law went into effect. There has been a report come out by the Williams Institute that states there has been no uptick in crime whatsoever related to this law. None. So the tactics that the anti-transgender haters are using is fear. Fear. They're saying, yes. let's go scare people into thinking that me... Men are dressing like women and just going into your bathroom. That's, that's the fear. Right, right. And and that's really not the case. That's not the, that's not the, the case. The statistics don't, don't back it up You don't at all. decide to dress like a woman one day and just go and, and use the bathroom for, for No, fun. No, I, I don't know of anyone. When I go to the restroom, I go to the restroom because my bladder says I need to go to the restroom. <laughs> yes. Or I go to the restroom because of other reasons that people go to the restroom. Sure. I go in and then I leave the restroom. Wash your hands. And <laughs> I've done it 100,000 times. And and to even and, and really how would you even enforce this law how, how, how are how are you enforcing this law are you questioning people's gender now you know if this were to be if they were if no were to pass 
How do you even how how are we even enforcing this law? I that I have no idea. Yeah. I have no idea. I think that the, what they're trying to do is this is a wedge, and they like if we can do something in Massachusetts to take away rights from the LGBT community, we can start taking rights away from other states, and then my feeling is is that they're also going to go after same-sex marriage. This is just, let's see what we can do. If they figure if they can succeed in Massachusetts at taking away a human being's rights, that they can succeed taking away human beings' rights elsewhere. Right. And so, I don't think Massachusetts is that kind of state. I think that they've messed with the wrong state, the opponents. I do. We're, we're very, we're, we're thoughtful, we're welcoming yep. here in Massachusetts. And I'm hopeful that we'll be voting yes on three. Yeah, yes on three is the most important because the ballot question can be written or very confusingly written in Massachusetts. I have yeah. discovered that since I've been up here. So just remember to vote yes on three just so that I can go out to dinner yeah. so that a transgender person... Without fear. Without fear. Yep. I mean, it's really that simple. I just want to be able to be a contributing member of the Society of Massachusetts. And for more information on the Yes on Three campaign, we can go to... FreedomMA.org. FreedomMA.org. And uh, you'll have all more information on the Yes on Three campaign. Yep. Thank you so much, oh, Kelly thank you. Jenkins Kelly. from the Yes on Three campaign. From the Yes on Three campaign. So yes, please just vote Yes on Three. Yes on Three. All right, great. So we're going to take a short break, and then we're talking with Kenny we're from the National GOE Day. All right. Thank you. I think of wellness as such a broad term because when we think of wellness, it's emotional wellness, it's physical wellness, it's social wellness. You know, it's there's all these components of wellness that mean something different to you than they do to me. And we're seeing that with the variety of guests that we get on and they go, how does this connect to wellness? Because we, we always think of wellness as a component of health. You know what I mean? I believe in everything that we do here at FATV, you know, where it's community involvement, where it's volunteerism, where there's civility, you know, opportunity. So if my message can be to the community, my God, these are things that you can do to improve your health or improve your life or recognize these signs and symptoms before they really get to be problematic, then I've done my job. Chess Chat is the only television program in the United States that presents chess in the way we do it. We try to be entertaining, we try to actually inform, educate our viewers as far as the, the world of chess, which is a, a fascinating world. If more people took up chess, and especially young players, they would actually be exposed to critical thinking, learning logic. I mean, I think this is very valuable for especially youngsters, you know, at early age to learn to be critical in their thinking because I want to let people know that chess is a fantastic game, but it's also an art, it's a science, it's a sport. The world of chess has a wealth of information about chess. We could, we could go on forever uh, talking about chess, chess players, chess events. I and my co-host will never run out of material for Chess Chat. Welcome to Inside Fitchburg. I'm your host, Alex Cardinale. Inside Fitchburg is, is pretty much a showcase of, the, of that work um, that folks are doing. A lot of conversation is, is really being steered in a really positive direction and more is being found out, I feel, you know, now, which is mm. really exciting stuff. Hey, we're back. I didn't have a microphone on. Uh, live TV, everybody. I think you're one of the examples of what the city really needs, and that's, you know, young, energetic folks investing. You guys look great for 150. Do what you love and you don't work a day in your life. Inside the Actors Studio with James Lipton. If you haven't, James Lipton is a, he's an old guy with a beard. And what it is is a lot of really good people working toward a better future for the city. Hi, welcome back to Discussing Fitchburg Now. Now we're talking about National GOE Day, which is Growth, Overcome, and Empower. Yes, very good. Yeah, th yeah. and this is a national day. Nas a national day, right? <laughs> yes, is, it is. Is this the first annual national day? 
It is the precursor to the first national day. So I put in uh, at two levels, national calendar and uh, Chase International and National Calendar, and they've both been accepted. Woohoo! Uh -huh. So yeah. go Fitchburg, go day. So this is Kanisha Coy uh, from the My Care Initiative. Yes, All Community right. Arts Research and Education. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so we're going to talk about, you know, the kind of the, the tenets of the, the Growth, Overcome and Empower Day. Why don't, it, why don't we go around the table and everybody introduce yourself. Okay. Hi, I'm Stephanie Dondero. I'm from the Family Service Unit at the Fitchburg Police Department. Good evening. I am Lieutenant Jeffrey Howe of the Fitchburg Police Department. Sorry, you already got introduced, but if you want to introduce yourself again, <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to step on you. Oh, that's right. My foot hurts a little bit. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> my name is Kanisha Coy. I am the executive director of My Care Initiative. That's Community Arts Research and Education and Breakthrough Silence Movement. Robert Hines. I'm the director of counseling at Fitchburg State University. All right, great. So, Kanisha, let's Sam. let's talk about it. What's going on with uh, the Growth Overcome and Empower Day? What is the significance behind it? Well, I found in the work that I was doing, um, we would have discussions with participants who suffered from child abuse and sexual assault. It would be stuck in, this happened to me. And I didn't feel like the conversation was moving any further. And it's important to identify abuse, I think, 100%. It's also, at some point, I think, important to ask the question, what do I need to do to move past this abuse? So I started thinking, well, how do we get people moving past this? The movement is active. Go, okay, well, you're growing, growth is active. How are you overcoming this? And then the E is about being empowered. Not being placed in this box of just solely abuse and just having to sit in that, but how can you move past that? And what will your life look like as a result of moving past? Mm -hmm. And so and you're working with uh, different organizations in the city like the, yes. the Family Services Unit at the Fitchburg Police Department. Yes, Stephanie and Lieutenant Hal, um, the police department, they've been really helpful in supplying information and um, attending events. And of course, Dr. Hines, he is with FAVE, has been very instrumental in just encouragement and showing up to events and providing education and just support I think is important. Support at the end of the day is key. And FAVE, what is FAVE? FAVE, FAVE is the Fitchburg Anti-Violence Education Program. It started up, I want to say, close to 10 years ago now. We had some federal grant money to um, uh, to uh, implement some new programming around um, domestic violence, uh, stalking, sexual violence. And so we um, now have continued the program even after the federal money dried up and we, we work hard to uh, provide educational programming to uh, both incoming students and students who are already at the university um, around those important issues. And then we also work to provide support to survivors uh, as well. Really, uh, it's, talking about it is so important, right? Yeah, but that's why, as a police department, uh, you know, obviously we're part of the community. Uh, we are the community, the police department. We're at one with the community. Um, <clears throat> while we're here, education is key. Knowledge is power. Uh, so if we can educate people, uh, individuals about domestic violence, uh, it's, it's a win for everybody. Uh, you can never have enough education on domestic violence. Even if you reach one more new person, that, that's a win, as yeah. far as we're looking at it. Uh, it's very near and dear to our hearts. Um, from the police department perspective, uh, a victim is our number one priority. We want to make sure they get the services they need, the help they need, from going through the court system uh, right through the recovery phase. Mm. Uh, we do multiple things to try to, try to help that person uh, the night. Uh, an incident will start, start that night, someone will call for service from us, um, an officer will respond. Depending on the situation, uh, an arrest could be made, a referral could be made. Um, we might drive the person to a shelter. We could, we could drive the person to Boston if we had to. We will drive the person anywhere they need to go to get the help they need. That's the number one priority. We want to make sure the person is safe. Um, and we treat these incidents very, very serious. And that's why we're here tonight. And once we do our part, there's a, the patrol function, we get the person so the person's safe. Uh, we then process the paperwork. And we process the paperwork to go to the court and then the court system gets involved. And once the court system gets involved, Stephanie steps into the picture, and she'll help the person uh, obtain restraining orders, uh, maybe obtain some other services that the person might not know about. Uh, and she, she's a great resource that we have in our department. We're very fortunate to have her. 
<clears throat> the mayor and the chief are very, very supportive of her position, and that's why she's here, because it's an important function that we provide uh, citizens of Fitchburg. So you're employed through the Fitchburg Police Department? Yes, I am an employee of the Fitchburg Police Department. Um, my position currently is grant funded um, through EOPS, and um, it's the Violence Against Women Act. And um, I'm going on my 10th year of service, and you know, hopefully it can continue and we can be there for the victims. And so you, you um, kind of solely service uh, victims of domestic violence and families? Yes, and um, some sexual assault victims as well. Mm. And I'm really glad you said that because with sexual assault, I think sometimes we think, um, this is a general, a broad statement, that these are isolated uh, different types of abuse. And they are different, but a lot of them do link. And you have child abuse, and you have sexual assault, and you have domestic violence, and they should be handled individually as it's relevant. But often you have generational abuse, and they do interconnect. So having services like Stephanie, like Fave, yeah. they are able to be segmented to how it's relevant, but looking at it in its whole, in its entity, is it's necessary. Mm. And, and, and talking about abuse, you bring up a good point. Talking about abuse, uh, we tend to forget. And that's why we're here tonight to educate everybody. We tend to forget uh, abuse can be mental abuse as well. Right. It doesn't okay. have to be physical. Thank you. For it saying can that. be financial abuse. You could uh, you could be the breadwinner in a relationship per se, for lack of a better term. Uh, and you can pull that over the person's head so the person's afraid to leave, afraid to uh, venture out on their own because they're afraid they not be able, might, might not be able to eat, they might not have a table over their uh, roof over their head. Uh, so that's, that's a big one, financial. Financial mm -hmm. abuse. It can be mm -hmm. financial abuse. They hold that over, over their heads and it, mm -hmm. it, we see that often. Often. Withholding funds and stuff mm -hmm. so they can't um, you know, be independent as a person. I used to work, uh, well one of my functions at another position was working hotline and I can't tell you how many calls I would get from people. My coworkers kind of always tease me because they were like, oh you get the hoity-toity people, but it would be people from well-to-do areas and they, they wouldn't have options because their abuser was holding, withholding funds. Mm -hmm. They withholding, were the breadwinner. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So they would have like. lavish surroundings, but they couldn't get out of said surroundings. So when you talk about educating uh, on abuse, right, um, is that a kind of a proactive? Because you know, when you talk about domestic abuse, you might think, well, everyone knows domestic. Everyone knows what that is, right? So what are some things that we might not know? Well, even just that right there, not yeah. everybody does know domestic abuse because mm -hmm. we have IPV, intimate uh, partner uh, violence. People don't necessarily know how that different that is different from domestic violence. Actually, is it? Yes, there are different functions within that. So it's creating a space where we're not putting people down for their lack of knowledge and uh, allowing them to be able to come to a table and being able to provide information from different resources. Mm -hmm. And go ahead. No, I was going to say even him from the college. Um, Roommate that can, that can be considered mm -hmm. a domestic right. roommate. Yeah, right. um, a blood relative that can be considered a domestic that we, we tend to forget about. Right. Uh, right, but we're not just talking about like fights. No, not just fights. It mm -hmm. could be a variety of things like like we discussed: financial, emotional, verbal, emotional, sexual. Yeah. Could be sexual. Mm -hmm. uh, and often, what we, we see from the police department point of view, um, a person will get arrested. Uh, they'll they'll have a black guy. Then they'll beg you, please don't arrest him or yep. arrest her. Yep. Uh, please don't, please don't. We ended up, you know, we arrest a person. We process them through our station. Uh, once they're arrested and once they're at our station, they have to be held for at least a minimum of six hours before they can be released. And then we get, would get bail on the person. And when the bail comes into play, sometimes the victim will come down to the station and try to bail the person out. Uh, we see that a lot. And because they're stuck in because the cycle. Because they're stuck in the right. cycle. Mm -hmm. right. And so what if, what if you have someone who is starting to become aware that they are in an abusive situation, but they don't want to take that step to have their significant other or roommate or whatever arrested potentially, or they could be fearful that what they're talking about is not really abuse at all and they're just overreacting. Mm -hmm. Who should they go to? Well, for our department, um, if, if I come across a case like that, uh, multiple times I would call Stephanie. I call her many, many times. Uh, she carries around a work cell phone. Uh, I would call her, fill her in, and she would get the ball rolling, rolling to try to get some resources for that person. Um, and also I have to give a shout out to our father's house. Uh, they've mm -hmm. helped us multiple times. Uh, when you call the state hotline to get a shelter, they might have two or three beds for the whole state. Right. Uh, that goes quick. So many times we've called uh, the state hotline 
uh, no beds available. So what do you do with that person? The person or their family. Yeah, mm -hmm. then the person has nowhere to go. So I'll, our father's house would step up. They get vouchers they can use for um, Hotel. hotels and whatnot. And uh, we would drive that person to that hotel. And, and that it doesn't necessarily mean it's in Fitchburg. It could be anywhere. Right. You know, safety is paramount. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's and interesting. That means, I'm sorry, Stephanie. Yeah, that's okay. But um, when you talk about sort of continuity of care, mm -hmm. it's hard for us to do treatment with someone that isn't safe. Mm -hmm. It's hard for us to do education with someone that isn't safe. Right. So we need safety first, right. and then we try to put those other pieces into uh, Absolutely. help survivors get through what they're getting through. So I love the fact that now there are these partnerships between law enforcement and educators and, and therapists, and, and it wasn't always that way. Right. Um, if you go back 20, 30 years, it was very disjointed, yeah. mm -hmm. and I'm not sure people got quite the effective care that they could have. But I love the fact that we work so closely with law enforcement now because we need our people safe before we can do a lot of things that we can do. Right. Mm -hmm. And that networking is key. It is. You know. And the scary thing for people, a victim, if you've never been through a court procedure, it's, it's very intimidating. Mm -hmm. um, even being a police officer, if I go to a new court, like let's say I have to go to Boston, it's intimidating for me. Mm -hmm. I never, you know, if you've never been in the system, it's mm -hmm. very intimidating. Mm -hmm. So Stephanie, luckily, we have her, and um, she'll walk the person through the court system. She'll take the person right to the court, uh, take her through the whole process, help the person get a restraining order if that's what they want. Um, so she's a great asset, and we're, we're lucky to have her. Yeah, yeah. It's enormously we're helpful. Lucky. Occasionally, we'll have students from the university who uh, benefit from, from working yeah. with Stephanie because it is a very intimidating experience it is. to show up at the Fitchburg uh, the court and try to get a harassment prevention order or abuse prevention order. Especially when so you're, you're yeah. facing your abuser. Right. Mm -hmm. Potentially. Right. Mm -hmm. Potentially. And so that does very happen. Yeah. That really does mm -hmm. happen. But uh, the YWCA also has yeah. safe plan advocates. Mm -hmm. So um, getting in contact with, with them court. and the hotline uh, with, this, with the YWCA. WCA, that's also helpful too, but because uh, they will go. Oh, yeah. well, that's they, okay. No, you're good. They'll go to court with you. Uh, and this is like Worcester, but occasionally I think they come out here too. But I, I don't know how much time we have. I know there's people after us. But what I want to stress to anybody that might be watching this that knows of a victim, um, have the victim talk to someone. If it's a pastor, that's fine. If it's a professor at the college, that's fine. If it's Kinesia, that's fine. Have the person talk to someone. Just talk to someone. Uh, say you need some help, you, we'll get you to help. There's yeah. a lot of resources out there. She mentioned a few. Uh, the Salvation Army is great. Uh, 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 Monetary Opportunity Council is great. Yep. Uh, Luck Inc. is great. There's yep. a lot of great organizations out there. Yep. Uh, that you girls, can, girls that you can call. Right. You can just call up Luck, yep. call up Salvation Army, yep, say, say I think I might need some help. Yep. Yep. Wherever you're comfortable. Montachusett Opportunity Council. Yep, they will help. The Fitchburg Police Department. Yep, even if it's at a hospital, if you if you were injured and you need to go to the hospital, tell the nurse. The nurse will call us. Um, the resources are there. You will. They will get the resources they need. Just tell someone. Uh, I'd like to mention a couple of the resources that might be, um, you know, helpful to some victims. Um, the Spanish American Center in mm -hmm. Lemonster, Massachusetts, and also, like Kanisha had mentioned, um, the YWCA um, and their domestic violence services. And, and they they're out of Worcester, right? Yep, yeah, and they have a 24-hour hotline number. Would you like me to state, state mm -hmm. that? Sure. 508-755-9030. And another thing, too, our department has, which um, we have a language hotline. Mm -hmm. uh, language hotline. Language hotline. I don't care what language you speak. Uh, if you come into our lobby, uh, we will be able to communicate with you. So uh, it's a direct translation. We have a direct mm -hmm. translation service. We can, we can uh, if it's Arabic, Russian, Chinese, mm -hmm. any, any language, we can uh, communicate with the person through cool. telephone. That so seems very important help. for the yeah, police department. It is. Very much so. Yeah. 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 It's great that you have that. Even sign language, there's, there's people we can call in for that too if someone uh, needs sign language. If you need help, call. There's, there's a lot of resources available. Yeah, but please actually use the resources because a lot, oftentimes people don't because of shame. Mm -hmm. They're ashamed. Yeah. They don't feel like they have anyone that's going to understand. They don't feel like right. they can say anything. And this is one of the reasons I think that we're all here yeah. is to be able to show you that you're not alone mm -hmm. in this and you have people that do care and you're Please just know that the shame is not on the you. The reason there are resources available is because it's not uncommon. Exactly. Because these things happen every right. day right. to people that you might that to people that you know, to mm -hmm. people in our community. Mm -hmm. Since your I friends, started, yeah. since I started um, my care initiative and in Breakthrough Silence, we've had this is three years, and it's only three years. Every time I, we talk about this, and since we've been doing shows like this, I get emails all the time about people. Thank you so much for talking about this. Thank you for 
having programs. Thank you for connecting with the Fitchburg Police. Thank you for talking and being active in this because it is, this is an epidemic. Mm -hmm. It's not trying to make it sound um, worse than it is. This is what it is. And by being creative with how we are connecting, we can hopefully serve people better. Okay, so just um, you know, before we, we leave this segment, let's just talk a little bit more about the types of abuse. I know that we started with that, but you know, let's let's talk a little bit more about what are some types of abuse that that people might think, oh, that, uh, this is not really, you know, this is not really that important. I think I'm overreacting. Uh, there's one population we <coughs> often forget forget about, and it's the elderly population. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes their caregiver uh, could be abusing them and they're afraid to say something because that's their lifeline to the outside. Mm -hmm. What happens if that lifeline is gone? Right. Um, so what so are, what are some common elder abuse cases? Uh, a lot of it, it can be financial, it could be physical, it could be verbal. Mm -hmm. uh, Just saying know. terrible things? Yeah. There, there, we've seen a lot of sad cases. Um, it does happen, unfortunately. I've heard of cases where you have elder abuse where um, the person who's being who is the abuser, they won't clean them. Exactly. They won't feed say them. that. Mm -hmm. They they'll withholding just keep things. Right, withholding and mm -hmm. oh well silent treatment. And we all know to a degree silent treatment might not necessarily be abuse, but in the in very specific cases it is. Mm -hmm. Right. And how, how we deal with that as a police department is we have an elder affairs officer, it's Officer Hurdle, Shelby Hurdle. Mm -hmm. uh, does a great job. She goes to monthly meetings. Uh, at, uh, I, I can't remember the name, it's in Lemister. Uh, Montachusett. Yeah. Uh, for the elderly, and they have meetings and they talk about stuff like this. And she might have to go do a home visit just to check to make sure everything's kosher. Uh, and she, she does a great job with that. So we're very proactive about that as well. So if you have a concern have, about that, you can call the Fitchburg Police yep. Department and talk to someone. Yep, if, if, they, if you call the Police Department, everything starts in a patrol division. The, and the officer will respond and uh, will take the initial complaint. And then from there, it gets disseminated to where it needs to go, whether it's uh, myself, Stephanie, uh, the elder officer, whoever. But we have that type of abuse. We have uh, abuse on children, obviously. We have, uh, but, the, but the big one I can't stress enough is the, the financial feeling, like what am I gonna do? Yeah, like they can't escape. Right. That there's no options, that there's no outlets for them to, right. you know, become independent again. and. And often people don't understand that because a common uh, question I hear is, well, why don't you just leave? And it's like, well, the decision to leave is instant, but the implementation of being able to leave is not necessarily mm -hmm. like that because there's so many connections of, well, how do I leave if this person's hold withholding my money? And where do you go? Now, but now how, does, how, does the, how do the authorities react to um, an, an abusive situation where someone is withholding finances? Mm -hmm. I mean, is that technically illegal? Uh, there is there is certain charges depending on uh, the, the fact pattern of the case, but there's multiple charges that can be filed, and sometimes the state would step in and help out as well, depending on what depending on the circumstances, the would depend on the agency that would get involved. Yeah. But uh, there is a mechanism mechanism in place to take care of that. But the important thing is to start talking about it. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Start talking about what what you're feeling. Start talking about your situation. Mm -hmm. Connect with the resources, because and then. Mm -hmm then you can figure out where right. to go from there. Because the, rea the reality is if you don't talk about it and you keep it in, it's going to come out in some way. And then there, there's negative coping mechanisms and it's talking about it is, is the foundation, it is the key. It's the first step. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the, the, the impetus of the, the GOE exactly. day, the exactly. Growth Overcome Empower Day. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, anything else? Um, that we should bring up before we... I just have one quick thing, if I could say something. Um, October 3rd, from 8 to 12, we're having Coffee with the Cop Day. It's a national event that takes place all over the, uh, the world, believe it or not. And it's gonna be held at Strong Style Coffee right on Cushing Street. So that's October 3rd, 8 to 12. There's gonna be some police officers there. There's a... Um, just come. Lieutenant Howe will be there? Yeah, I, I will be there. Uh, yes, I will. Yes. After my <laughs> You're on the flyer. Day, I will be there. <laughs> uh, but that's very important for the community to come out. Uh, j no agenda, just come out and talk. Yep. Mm -hmm. Chat, we'll have a cup of coffee. Talk about anything. You'll meet some of the great officers that patrol your neighborhood. Um, and if you have any questions about domestic violence, feel free to ask. Questions about anything else, that's what we're there for. Um, you know, like I said, we're part of the community, so we want to continue doing stuff like this, and that's why we're all here. 
So. Uh, really quickly, Go Day, uh, it will be officially the first Sunday of a full weekend in October. It'll be on the calendars in 2019. Uh, Governor Baker's giving us a proclamation for the day. Woohoo, thank you. Uh, Natalie, or Representative Higgins, has uh, also given, given us recognition. And, and she's coming on with us next. She is. Yeah. And uh, we'll give you more information as it comes. All right, great. So we're going to take a short break, and then we're going to bring on our next, uh, our next segment of panelists to talk about the National GOA Day and uh, what it means to um, or grow and, or, and overcome. All right? Thank you for Thank having you. us. Thanks, sir. The people that I interview motivate me, and there are days that I might be very tired from working my real estate all day and I think, oh, do I really want to do this? And I walk in here and the lights and the camera come on and I meet wonderful people and voila, I'm motivated. People often ask me, 37 years, haven't you run out of interesting topics or interesting people? And there are so many interesting people. And I love spotlighting someone who hasn't gotten the recognition that I think they deserve. Your function as an interviewer is not to editorialize your opinions, but to get other, draw other people out and ask the right questions that they will, you'll get more and more from them. I'm still hanging in there after nearly 38 years. We're almost up to 38, so they'll have to kick me out because I'm not quitting. think of wellness as and welcome back to discussing Fitchburg now where we're discussing the national growth overcome and empower day with Kenesha Coy and okay. friends from uh, Kenesha Coy is from the my care initiative yes community arts research and education yes. all right and so we have our next panel up uh, guests on. Why doesn't everybody, why don't we go around and introduce yourself? Okay, I'm Miriam Ruiz. I'm, an ex, I re, I'm a retired teacher. I've been teaching in Fitchburg for many years. Um, four certifications and uh, worked in McKay Academy, which is now Longo and uh, Memorial. And a new member of the Cultural Council in yes, Fitchburg. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. And I'm also on her committee. I'm a member, uh, a of, member of the board. My Care, My Care uh, Initiative. Board? Yes, yes, board. Oh, great. So, thank keeping you. busy. <laughs> I'm Heidi Sulabuff, and I'm from Pathways for Change. I'm the counseling director. Me, you already know, Kenesha. Yeah. I'm Natalie Higgins. I'm the state representative in Lemonster, uh, but I also got my start as the teen counselor at Pathways for Change, the Worcester County Rape Crisis Center. So um, our second segment, we're really going to largely talk about overcome, gro mm -hmm. growth and overcoming, mm -hmm. education right? and Healing. overcoming. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. absolutely. Right. So, so what? So what are the what are the major tenets of that? It's going to look different for everyone. Um, why I just thought that this is important to talk about and why it has motivated me to start GO is just that the healing looks different for everyone. Mm. The road is winding and there are significant highs and there are very significant lows. And I think it's important for everyone who is on their healing journey to start. And that might sound um, just really obvious, but it's not because a lot of people keep this in. Right. They keep the pain, they keep the shame in. And I, as I was saying before, um, if you don't release it, it manifests in other ways. It feels like the, the first trigger for um, starting to heal is always to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Is that right? And yeah. thank you for even saying that. And we have some wonderful people who are going to share uh, their amazing stories and information. Talking about this is important, but also being a safe space for somebody to talk about it with is important. Not shaming a person mm -hmm. into the, what, well, why did that, why did it take you so long to talk, talk about this? Mm -hmm. Why did it take mm -hmm. uh, you so long to tell anybody? Why didn't you just leave? These mm -hmm. things are not helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, yeah, and just to piggyback off of that, mm -hmm. when I trained as a rape crisis counselor when I was in college, mm -hmm. I went through this 70 hour training mm -hmm. and all of a sudden all a, a lot of my family members mm -hmm. and friends were disclosing to me because yep. all of a sudden right. I was a safe person that they knew that they were right. going to be able to trust yeah. and that I wasn't going to shame them I wasn't going to question them I was going to be there for them right. and that was really hard for me I had all of these people who were quietly right. keeping this trauma and right. didn't have right. a safe person to talk to and for me as a loved one that was right. difficult right. and that's telling that's really telling because what we hope that we can do as a society is come together right. mm -hmm. and support people you know, they say it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it takes a village to support a survivor. Mm -hmm. And we need to create an environment when we're believing survivors' disclosures and not villainizing survivors right. like we, we're, we're seeing currently. I, I, I shouldn't be shocked, but 20 mm -hmm. years I've been with Pathways for Change, and I'm still hearing that same rhetoric today that I did 20 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. Boys will be boys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're hearing a lot of that today. Yes, yes. unfortunately, and it's, and it's horrifying. Right. Um, and as a survivor, I have um, heard that my whole life. Mm -hmm. right? And so that is 2018, our agency is 45 years old this year, and it's it's shocking. We need to figure out what we need to do in our society, in our communities. So we're not, so we're really not just talking about teaching people to come out and talk, but we're teaching people how to listen mm -hmm. and how to respond. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And have different perspectives because men are abused too. Mm -hmm. And right. we've got to stop buying into this hyper masculinity of, well, if you cry, then you're a girl. No, if you cry, that means you have emotions and there was a reason why you were shedding tears. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take away from your masculinity at all. And it doesn't mean that you don't get, you, you shouldn't share. Of course you should right. share. Right. And the boys will be boys. Right. So, no. Right. That should and never have to be right. somebody's experience. And it's right. true what you said about having some a safe person to mm -hmm. talk to. I've had friends that I, I've had to talk to, and I'm going back many years. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, who, and, and I had one friend who gave me the courage to go back to school and get educated. And I wanted to be educated for my children. And um, I think that's important, important to have someone safe. Mm -hmm. And education, because education doesn't have to look like you're only going to university or college. I'm not saying it's not important, mm -hmm. but getting a sense of yourself, that right. is education in and of itself. And that's one of the best ways of being educated because you kind of get to a sense of, well, I'm willing to do this, but I'm not willing to do this. I want this for my life. I don't want that for my life. Mm -hmm. And then that goes into healing. Well, what do I want for my healing journey? And sometimes you don't know, mm -hmm. but it's important to take one step and that step will lead to another step. Well, since it's, it's so prevalent in the news today, talking about um, sexual mm -hmm. misconduct mm -hmm. or rape um, from men to women, Mm -hmm. You know, what, what What are the common, you know, and, and most go unreported, mm -hmm. is that correct? Yeah, I actually have some, um, yeah, some stats on that. So 42 million adult survivors of child abuse in the United States, roughly they go unreported. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's really because, I mean, let's think about it. What is it, one in three um, girls? Mm -hmm. one, one in three females. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's from, from birth to adulthood mm -hmm. have experienced some form of sexual violence. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the other part of that statistic that shocks a lot of people is one in five men. Mm -hmm. Right. One in five right. men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we have to think, like, how many people are not disclosing right. that. Right. Exactly. So. And I suspect that over time, if we continue doing the mm -hmm. good stuff that we're doing and helping create an environment where survivors can disclose in a safe way, that we might see those numbers getting closer and closer. Exactly, and that's the point. And this is right. why it's so important that organizations like Pathways for Change go into our middle schools and our high schools and talk about healthy relationships and talk about gender norms and yep. break down some of that. Because when I was the teen counselor, there were so many sessions that I would have teens come up to me after and said, I didn't know that that counted. Right. And that. Yep. It's hard. Right. What's uh, an example of something that might count? Um, 
I mean, the videos we would show would be like intimate partner rape. Like mm -hmm. the person said no, the person forced them, the person was crying, and still kids were saying, I didn't know that counted because she was drinking. She thought he mm -hmm. was cute. She mm -hmm. invited him to the room. Mm -hmm. uh, why didn't she yell no enough? Yeah. Why didn't she hit him harder? Like all yeah. of those things. And it's, I think it comes from a place of you don't want to think that it could happen to you. Right. Right. So it's better to put that blame on the victim and say, right. clearly, right. They could have done more to prevent she it from happening. She probably shouldn't have dressed like that. Yeah, right. exactly. Or even getting aroused. People think that just because there's arousal happening in our body, we are human and mm -hmm. things are going to happen, that doesn't necessarily mean I wanted you to touch me there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. and, and I recently read an interview um, that was discussing whether she said no or not. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's not just if you said no. Right. And so we're moving much more towards affirmative consent. So yeah. the idea that you yeah. actually ask and make sure that you have consent. And that plays a huge role into kind of the campus culture right. yeah. and alcohol and substance right. use mm -hmm. and whether or not someone can actually yeah. give consent. If, right. the, if the person has the ability to say yes. Mm -hmm. right. and, and what we're doing and what Natalie did when she was with our agency and what so many other counselors are doing is teaching a form of healthy sexuality long after we should have learned it. We should have learned it much younger mm -hmm. so that we're growing up with a healthier sense of sexuality. So if something does happen, you have a much clearer idea that, no, this should not be happening. Right. You should not be doing this to me. Mm. And dispelling stranger danger. I mean, of course, right. we should mm -hmm. teach our children, strangers, be mm -hmm. careful. But most abuse happens with someone you know. Mm -hmm. the, the, statistically, you're more likely to be abused by someone you know yes. or someone yes. you're related to. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. So recognize signs of abuse. Is that an important thing that we should bring up? What are some signs of abuse that maybe parents should be watching out for their children? Mm -hmm. Is there, are there signs? Changes of behavior, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, if you have an outgoing child and they tend to back off and they're more timid, it doesn't necessarily mean there's abuse, but you should question it. Um, a, a youth that I was working with, um, he was continuously talking about running away. Mm -hmm. And he'd been this outgoing kid, and it was like, well, why are you trying to run away? And he's like, oh, nobody's going to believe me. And mm -hmm. it come to find out that he was being abused. And he did try and talk about it, but they were like, oh, no, you're just seeking attention. Mm -hmm. No. He wasn't seeking attention for attention's sake. He was seeking attention because something was happening to him. So, so. listen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Listen. Pay attention. And one of the things that I want uh, Growth Overcome and Empower Day to be is a place where we can talk about relationships from the sense of don't feel like you have to be with someone just for the sake of, of companionship. Learn how to be by yourself. Learn how to hopefully not have your children in situations where they're being sacrificed so that you can not be lonely because that mm -hmm. happens often. Mm -hmm. So let's figure out self-care from the perspective of, well, what can I do to decrease my loneliness mm -hmm. and increase healthy ways of connecting with myself, with others? Mm -hmm. All right, we have uh, one more minute left. So uh, any, any important statements we want to make? Uh, to the audience. Most importantly, start by believing. Mm -hmm. Start mm -hmm. by believing. When people tell mm -hmm. you something happened, believe them. Believe them. And if it turns out that that 1% of a, 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 a wrong accusation or false accusation, then so what? We'll deal with it. We'll deal yeah. with yeah. it. Mm -hmm. right. There's 99% of other people whose stories are absolutely valid and we need to hear them. Absolutely. And as loved ones knowing that that healing process can take right. a long time and right. even five years out, like there are some really hard days yeah. and that's hard for me and I get upset about it, um, but making sure that the folks who care about me understand that like it's it's going to take right. time. Right. I'm so glad you journey. said that. Mm -hmm. It is a journey. Healing and there journey. are resources available mm -hmm. yes. for you to talk to. Free counseling at Pathways, Pathways for Change. Change. Yep, 800-870-5904 is our hotline. Free, um, anonymous, and we also have our free counseling services. And we have a gala coming up on October 12th where we're going to be honoring Natalie Higgins. Mm -hmm. It's um, Eventbrite if you can find, um, if you want to get a ticket. 
we'd love to have you. All right, great. So uh, we have um, My Care Initiative here. We're talking about National GOE Day, which will be a 2019 yes. official day. Official follow day. On fa follow My Care Initiative on Facebook. And yes. thank you, everyone, for joining us and talking about this difficult topic. Thank you for having, thank us, you for having so us so much. Seriously, thank you for having us.